you all for joining us today. It's really exciting to have you here. Um, so uh, today we're talking about graphing multivariate categorical data. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on mosaic plots and alluvial diagrams. Um, so this is going to be the how, what, and why of mosaic plots and alluvial diagrams. Um, so uh, I'm Luda, or Ludmilla, you can call me Luda, um, and uh, I am a data scientist at Amplify. Amplify is an education technology company that uh, focuses in cur curriculum development, so essentially a textbook company, but with an online platform. Um, and I focus specifically on our science product. Um, and I'm uh, coming to you, for, I usually live in Brooklyn, but I'm coming to you today from upstate New York. Uh, fingers crossed, uh, they, I'm visiting my uncle and uh, internet isn't great, so I have my phone as a hotspot. Hopefully everything will be okay, but please let me know if you're having any issues. Um, also having some seasonal allergies, so you know, excuse any sneezing, <laughs> uh, but hopefully things will uh, go fine. Um, but yeah, please let me know if you're having any issues, issues hearing me or seeing my screen or anything like that. Um, and uh, now I just want to introduce our co-host, uh, Joyce. Hi, I'm Joyce Robbins. I'm uh, an instructor in the statistics department at Columbia University in New York. I teach data visualization um, to our master's students in the statistics department, as well as in the Data Science Institute. I have a course called EDAV that I teach every semester. And then the rest of my schedule is generally introductory statistics classes. I met Luda through Our Ladies in New York, one a wonderful organization. And a fun fact is that both of our moms are in data science and code in R. So, um, it's kind of cool. Not many. You can't. You don't meet a lot of people uh, with that, <laughs> with that uh, genealogy. I, I should say. So, um, Luda's going to give us the um, go through the agenda quickly, and then we'll get started. Yeah, and our moms actually watch this, so this has been mom approved. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, our agenda today is that um, you know we're going to over a welcome right now. First, we're going to move into the mosaic plots with a code along with Joyce. Um, and then we'll move to alluvial diagrams. We'll take about a five minute break after that. Um, and then we're gonna move into a lab for about 30 minutes uh, where you'll get to practice making uh, your own graphs. Um, and then we'll come back together and discuss the lab results, uh, go over solutions um, as desired, our, 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 you know, our versions of the graphs, not necessarily the right solution, but um, so I just want to point out that all of our materials are here on our GitHub. It's also pinned in our Slack channel. Um, you might want to go ahead and pull if you haven't already recently, um, since uh, we did make, you know, a couple last minute changes as always. Um, so, uh, but you'll find all of the slides there for um, the code along, uh, all of our slides and all of the code for the code along. Uh, you also find code for the uh, lab section. Um, we encourage you to ask questions at any time. One of us, whoever isn't, um, you know, giving uh, their section will be answering questions on chat. We'll also try to keep an eye on the Slack as well. So it's a little easier for us um, to just get the questions right in the chat. Um, and, you know, we encourage you to participate as much as you want. You're welcome to turn your video on. You're welcome to, you know, be involved. Um, but it's up to you uh, how much you want to participate. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Joyce, who's going to start us off. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and excited to uh, discuss mosaic plots with you. So I'll just... Um, just point out one more thing on our repo, which is that we have these links to uh, the specific slides. So the slides I'm gonna show you first are these uh, mosaic slides. And then when we do the code along, um, you may want to um, open this up in our studio, whatever works best for you. Some people like to uh, code at the same time or just watch what I'm doing um, either way. And when we get to the um, breakout rooms, we'd encourage you to turn on your videos so that you can meet people um, and work together with them. So 
Um, let's um, start with what a mosaic plot is. I've cobbled together this definition from a number of different places. It's a little bit hard to explain, but I think that this um, does it as well. At least this is the best I can do for this. It's a space filling visualization in which the area of each small rectangle is proportional to the frequency count for a unique combination of levels of the categorical variables displayed. So that's a mouthful. I'm going to break it down with this um, example. And um, what, what this um, shows is births in the United States in 2019. There were um, over 3.7 million births actually going down. At some, in some years, we had over 4 million births. Broken down into age category, pre-pregnancy weight, and then weight gain during pregnancy. This is data from the uh, Centers for Disease Control. So uh, there are seven different levels of age. So this particular mosaic plot was created by first cutting what we call cutting or splitting on age, proportional to the number in that group. So this um, rectangle, which isn't even a rectangle since it's so small, represents the, the mothers under the age of 15 years. The next one is 15 to 19 years, et cetera. The second cut is by pre-pregnancy weight grouped into four categories. And I've intentionally left out the label so you can just focus on the kind of the, the uh, structure of the plot. So there's four different weight categories. So you, those are what we call vertical cuts. And then the last cut is horizontal and that represents the weight gain. So what we're looking for in a mosaic plot is whether um, the proportions are consistent or not consistent. If, the, if you see something that looks like a piece of graph paper or in New York, we would say the Manhattan grid where all the streets and avenues are lined up at right angles, then that is telling you that there is no or little association between the variables. When you get a staircase like this, where things are off, that tells you that there is an association. And that's the purpose. And we're going to compare mosaic plots to other types of plots and see um, when it's useful to use a mosaic plot as opposed to a, another type of graph or categorical data. So. Um, before, um, and, and this just shows you that, you know, with those um, seven levels of age, four levels of weight, and seven levels of gain categories, you end up with 196 rectangles. And the area each, once again, is proportional to um, the count. I want to contrast a mosaic plot with a tree map. These are often confused because these are both space filling visualizations. There's no white space other than perhaps some borders, but not within the plot itself. A tree map, though, shows hierarchical data. So here, um, the employees are divided first into a high-level category, and then within each high-level category, indicated by the fill color, it's broken down further into subcategories and then sub-subcategories, et cetera. So it shows something completely different. There's You don't have that consistent number of rows, columns, and, and splits. For, for each, you can see that there's no lines that go, there, a few go directly across, but then the rest of them do not go um, directly across. There's no, within any one box, you can't indicate the, the variables and the levels of the variables in the same way as you can with a mosaic plot. So let's just remind ourselves what numeric data looks like because we love numeric data so much. It's so easy, it's so convenient, it's so consistent, it's lends itself so naturally to the Cartesian coordinate system with an x-axis and a y-axis. We don't have that with categorical data. Categorical data is messy. It comes in different uh, data types. It needs to be cleaned. There's no obvious way to graph it. So that's where the challenge is. So if you find yourself struggling with categorical data and you're wondering, you know, why is this hard? It's just a bunch of words. It's just a few categories and it seems like it should be easy. You're not alone. It is difficult and there are fewer options for categorical data. Um, our kind of go-to for numerical data for looking at the relationship association between two columns in a data frame for uh, um, would be a scatter plot. Can't do that with categorical data. If you try doing that, you get something that's meaningless because you just get a lot of overlap of points since 
you're limited to a few levels for each of those um, categories. I guess it could work in certain situations with a huge number of categories, uh, but that is not very common. Now let's um, consider the multivariate part of growth, graphing multivariate categorical data. Um, sometimes people think they're graphing multivariate data when they're not. I have this issue with students. They'll give me a lot of things that look like this, um, where it looks like they're considering a lot of variables together. This is the percentage of adults who've ever tried an e-cigarette in their lifetime, according to um, a survey by, um, at least that was published by, uh, also by the CDC from 2014. So we have the percentages uh, for men and women for different age categories, for different uh, racial categories, but none together. So that in my mind is not, that's just a series of um, univariate data. It's not truly multivariate because you don't have any interactions. You don't know if um, how, how the two connect, okay? Or three connect. So we're interested not in data that looks like this, but in truly multivariate data. Now, I'm going to be talking about mosaic plots that are good for um, proportional association, as I've said. Luda is going to discuss uh, alluvial diagrams. And the kind of big punchline there is that they're great for change of state. When you have multiple states and you want to if, follow a flow from one state to another. There are other types of um, visualizations for categorical data, and we certainly don't mean to imply that mosaic plots and alluvial diagrams are the only way to go. So the most common way it, to show uh, categorical data is with a bar chart. When you use fill and faceting, and you can um, increase the number of variables that you can show, and I'll give you a quick example. Cleveland dot plots are an underutilized form that also work really well if you're trying to show frequency. So what we're talking about here is where you really just want, you know, what's the highest number? You're not necessarily interested in um, mosaic plots. So one criticism of mosaic plots that I've heard is that um, they're not, they don't, it, they're hard to read numbers. Well, that's not the point of that. Right? The point of them is to be, look, is to, for looking at the associations among variables. So you're not as concerned with uh, frequency there. So um, this is the same data with labels this time for the 2019 births. It's faceted on these pre-pregnancy weight groups and um, the x-axis is used for the age categories and the fill for the gain. It's common to use um, the fill color for the dependent variable. So we can see here easily what the highest number is. It's women, the highest number of births were to women um, in the 125 to 174 uh, weight category who are between the ages of 30 and 34. And then within that, you can look at the weight gains, um, 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 pounds are, uh, there are the most common. And the Cleveland dot plot shows you uh, the same um, information. This time I faceted on age instead of on uh, the weight category. And again, we see the highest values are for those 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 pound gain categories for women um, who are aged 30 to 34 and in that 125 to 174 category. So if you really wanted to see what is the, you know, the most common of those 196 possibilities, a Cleveland dot plot does, does, that, um, does that well. But again, that is not our concern here. So we're going to move back to the issue of proportion or association and consider a very simple um, data set. It, is, it involves whether older Americans or younger are more interested in local news than younger Americans. And this is uh, data from the Pew Research Center. They surveyed and asked uh, many questions, including this one, to almost 35,000 adults asked whether they follow local news very closely and 34.5% said yes. The sizes of the groups based on age um, were varied from about 2,800 to over 11,000. And we're not actually gonna look at the original, we're not gonna start with the original data. We're going to start with a hypothetical and think about 
what it would look like if there were no association. So if age didn't matter, if people followed uh, local news at the same rate, you know, despite their age or regardless of their age, what would the breakdowns look like? Well, we would just take 34.5% of um, each of these um, group sizes and say that those are the followers of local news and these are the non-followers. Again, not the real data. Let's see what a mosaic plot of this data looks like, okay? We, we build it by first making cuts in one dimension on the age category, and then on um, the group category, whether they're followers or non-followers. And there are a couple of very important um, design decisions here, as well as information about how to read it. So the first thing we see is, um, as we might expect, because this is kind of rigged data to show no association, we do get that graph paper Manhattan grid look, right? Because the proportions are the same regardless of age. In terms of the design, this is following um, best practices. I, um, the guru here is Anthony Unwin, who wrote a book, Graphical Data Analysis with R, who recommends drawing mosaic plots in this way um, that includes cutting on the independent variable first on age, making that cut vertical, and then cutting next on the dependent variable, assuming there's just two variables, we'll get to what happens when there are more later. So the second cut is horizontal, and it, it cuts on the, the dependent. And then within the categories of the dependent variable, we put the one that we're most interested in on the bottom closest to the x-axis or where we imagine the x-axis would be, and use a, a more prominent fill color for that to show. So you really see where, what the followers, where the followers are. So now let's see what the actual data looks like and how it compares to this. And um, we end up with a more staggered look like in the first mosaic plot that I showed you, where we, we see that in fact, right, the proportion of um, young people who follow the local news closely is much smaller than, the, than in the 65 plus. And um, there is a, a a gradual increase as you go through the age categories from um, in terms of the proportion of people who follow the local news. So again, it goes, you know, you can see how that jumps from one to the other. Now, when I talk about, if I call this the expected values and this the observed values, um, what does that bring to mind for anyone in, the, in a statistical direction? Any tests come to mind? Key square? Yes, yes, yes. So um, you can think of, and you don't have to, but you can think of the uh, mosaic plot as a visualization of a chi square, just kind of like the way that a scatter plot is the visualization of a linear regression, right? Or two dimensional linear regression. A chi square, a mosaic plot. Um, and this is really part part of of how uh, of the de the design um, visualizes the observed and expected in a in a in a chi square. And so, um, in this particular case, that association that we saw is statistically significant if you performed a chi square um, test. If this doesn't speak to you at all, that's fine. You can make use of mosaic plots and learn a lot about categorical variables without um, doing any tests. Um, it's I think um, exploratory data analysis stands on its own. You can think of it either as like a pre precursor to um, more to statistical analysis or just, you know, in its own right. I'm missing that. Okay. Yes. So um, let's um, break it down more. And you may have noticed I have not showed you any code yet. I believe in showing you kind of the theoretical, how it's, how a mosaic plot is constructed. You can, there are different packages. I'm going to show you how to do it with the VCD, Visualizing Categorical Data Package. Uh, but there are the packages in R, there's plenty of packages in other ways. And I want you to really focus on the principles so that you could do this um, and any, anywhere. So we said first cut's vertical, um, that is the independent variable. Second cut is um, horizontal. Um, and remember, 
when you're reading a mosaic plot, you think about what would it look like if there were no association. We're gonna add another hypothetical. Besides no association, you also wanna keep in mind kind of what would it look like if, it were, if there were a deterministic relationship? So if your age completely determined what, um, whether you follow or don't follow local news, what do you think it's gonna look like that? Probably something like this, right? Where you get um, no, there are no followers, in the younger age groups, and then everyone in the um, 65 plus age group is, uh, is a follower of local news. So these are the extremes, and we're trying to figure out where we are in between. Like I say to my students, you know, that this is what statistics really is all about, like trying to figure out where we are between no connection and complete connection. If there's no connection, you don't need these techniques. If there's a deterministic relationship, you don't need these kind of ticks. I mean, we're always in kind of that that um, murky area where there's a connection, but it's it's not it's not uh, one hundred percent. So we're going to go back to the birth data and um, just familiarize ourselves with these categories. There are seven age categories, um, four pre-pregnancy weight categories, and um, seven different weight gain categories. The data was already in groups. I cleaned it up um, just because there were some, and this is one of the challenges that, that you face often with categorical data in that you'll have some categories that hardly have any data in them and they're really hard to show. I just grouped everything in the 225, above 225 into this, everything above 60, because they're small. They're not going to, it's not going to distort things to, to put them together, but that all depends on, the situation and, and what's going to work in that particular situation. A couple other things, I'm using a sequential um, color scheme, be, color schemes both for weight and for weight gain because there it's ordinal data, there's a natural order to the categories, you must preserve that order. If you had um, data that didn't, that's nominal, that doesn't have a natural order, then you can, you don't have to do it that way. Um, the Generally, though, you're going to want, if I'm in these two cases, I'm treating these as dependent variables. And as I said before, you want the fill color to be the um, one at the bottom and the most, the most important category to be at the bottom and the most prominent color. And it depends, again, on what, 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 what you think is most important. I'm assuming here that the high weights are important for medical purposes and um, pregnancy risk, but if if I were interested in, I'm sure a low pregnant, with that, not, I'm not a medical person, but I would guess that a five pound weight gain during pregnancy is also of concern. And so, you know, if that's what your focus is and you're trying to figure out why people aren't gaining weight during pregnancy, you may want to reverse it and put that on the bottom. So there, there is some choice. Um, so this one shows, um, pre-pregnancy weight as the dependent variable based on age. What do we think? Is there association, no association? What, what do you see here? Alisa? There is some association. All right, there is some. What do you notice in particular? That the, the lines move in a, uh, how to say? It looks like uh, scattered. Um, the areas are different in the different rectangle rectangles. Mm -hmm. the, the ratios are different. So, you know, these interestingly, weight doesn't seem to make a, above age twenty. Yeah, doesn't it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. There seems to be a much uh, smaller weight gain for the fifteen to nineteen category. Uh, remember, this is all just pregnant women, so I would expect to see. Um, a stronger association between weight and age if um, they're older. If we were dealing yeah. with all people, not just mm -hmm. um, pregnant. Um, right, good, Michelle. So um, if we look at weight gain against age also, um, there's a slight association. It's very consistent though, right? That um, the older pregnant women tend to gain a little bit less weight 
than the younger ones for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, there's this is a little bit of an exception. There's some, you know, a little dipping down and then up again for the 30 to 34 um, category. Um, this is the one that um, is interesting. It shows the strongest association and one that um, Ludwig and I weren't necessarily expecting as we were exploring this data that um, the the mothers with the highest pre-pregnancy weights actually tended to gain less weight. And maybe that makes sense in terms biologically, um, but it wasn't, wasn't necessarily what I would have expected. But you can see that clearly, right? That the gain of zero to 10 pounds increases um, as the pre-pregnancy weight increases. Um, you also see though that the highest weight increases as the pre-pregnancy weight increases, the highest weight gain. So there's the greatest variance for the um, pre the mothers with high pre-pregnancy weights. Uh, but there's clearly a strong association there. And now um, we are moving on to uh, three variables. So with three variables, again, your dependent variable will be the last cut in horizontal. The order of the other variables Try it both ways. Try cutting on one first and then the other, and then going back. So which one was this cut? What, where was the first cut here? Right, the first cut's on weight, sorry. And you can tell that because um, the lines go all the way, um, the, the groups are together for the different weight categories. Right. So you see how these this line goes all the way across, all the way across, all the way across. So that was the first cut where these borders are. And you can control whether they're borders or no borders. I put borders on this one just on the first cut. The second cut is within each weight group, cut on age. And then the last cut is the horizontal one for the weight gain um, category. And you can see within each um, weight group, the um, gains are pretty similar, right? They're this Within each of these, right there, you're getting the grid. And then there's a big difference though, as we've seen before, between the weight categories. So let's say you try it the other way and do the age cut first, right? That really shows you the, the strong association between gain and weight that we saw before. So trying things in different ways helps you um, visualize, helps you un understand those relationships. The most important things in drawing the mosaic plots are the order of the cuts and the direction of the cuts. I'm going to show you some things about the labels, but I will warn you, the labels are a pain <laughs> and you can't always get it. You can't always get what you want. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Um, you can get close. You can, if you see this time, I, I left the categories on the bottom. This time I, I labeled just some cells and even here it's not perfect. It's, it's, it's difficult, but I'll, I'll get more into that um, later. So there's a, another example here. This is with the housing data in the um, mass package. Another um, good use of a mosaic plot, but I'm going to move on now to, um, to the coding. So we're going to go to our studio, but first I'll just remind you about the dependent variable being split last and being split horizontally. Um, the highlighting, this is a typo, it's highlighting. Uh, fill only affects the dependent variable. So that was a little confusing when I was first doing them because I wasn't sure what was getting, what I was setting with the fill. It's setting just the last cut. Um, your best bet is to try to split the other variables vertically first. And you can experiment in a lot of different ways. These are not like hard and fast rules, but these are guidelines that will get you, you know, there's a lot when you take to, the number of different ways you can do it, it, get, it goes up quick exponentially, right? When it, with each new variable, since you can make that, you can change the order and you can change the directions of the cuts. So there's a lot of possibilities, even with three variables. Um, try first vertical, vertical, horizontal. And if that doesn't work, you can try um, something else. Now, Here's the introduction to the coding. As I said, we're using the VCG package. There's also GG Mosaic. 
I want to like the GG Mosaic more than VCD because I like working in Tidyverse. I use GG Platu all the time. It's just not at the level of VCD in terms of options, in terms of um, stability and everything else. Maybe it'll get there. It's not there right now. So I just am more comfortable doing VC, using VCD. There's also some issues in that the, the, there's some workarounds in GG Mosaic for labeling because it's not there's some things that just don't work within the ggplot2 framework. So um, students of mine have, though, have used it and used it successfully. I don't want to discourage you. This is just my personal preference, so I'm going with um, this. The most important things are the order and direction. Once again, I'm going to say that a lot. So the order is controlled by the formula in your call to the, uh, to the mosaic function in the VCD package. Um, using formula notation, the dependent variable is on the left of the tilde. The independent variables are to the right. The cuts go in the order beginning with the first independent variable. So the order of the cuts here is weight, age, gain. Okay. The data and then the direction. The direction um, follows the order of the cuts, not the order of the formula. So this, v, this first V connects with the weight, the second V connects with age, and this H for horizontal connects with gain, the last cut. Okay. So if you, by the end of this, just learn the order and the direction, feel good, that's all great. All the rest is just gravy, the labels, the colors, and all that kind of and the, the level of the dependent variable, we said we want to be the darkest or most noticeable close to the x-axis. How do you think you control our people? How do you think you control uh, which level of the variable is um, closest to the x-axis or at the bottom of the mosaic plot? And the re-level function? Exactly, right? Our favorite thing, re-leveling the uh, levels of the factor variables. And I like to use the four cats package. There's a lot of nice um, functions there for recoding, relabeling, lumping things together. I don't have time to go into a lot of that today, into really any of that today, but it is in my code. So you can um, look at it and see and ask questions about it. So um, we're gonna go to the mosaic code along. Here's the reference for more from Anthony Unwin. So how am I doing with time? I'm not sure exactly when we started. Um, I think I have till 4.30, is that good? Okay. So we don't want this, we want this. Um, this is all just here for um, you to reference later all of my data cleaning. So I'm going to just clean and point out a few important things. And um, this is to save you time because some of these things just were not obvious to me or intuitive. You must have a free, even though you don't use, if you noticed in the code I showed you, there was no frequency column mentioned. I only mentioned the dependent and independent variables. I didn't mention the count column or um, frequency column. It has to be there, okay, but, um, and it has to be named frequency, F-R-E-Q, like that. Okay, so in this data set, it was listed as births. I changed it to freak so that I have that um, the way it should be. I'm using um, data in a um, tidy format with, um, I'll show you what it looks like with a frequency column. You can use tables and it all works fine, but most people are more comfortable, at least I'm assuming people are more comfortable with the tidy data format. Now, the other thing, the other super important thing to know about VCD is you cannot have spaces in your variable name. So I'm changing, um, I'm creating a very short single word name for each, uh, column name for each of these variables. And then I'm doing things that I mentioned before, like combining and recoding things so that I have a smaller number of categories. So we're just gonna do that. And now um, 
We'll see what the data looks like for st uh, starting. And we have now just four columns, the age, weight, gain. Notice these are all factors and the frequencies. And we can just look at the beginning. Like this is really, un this stands for under 15. And then the weight gain, the pre-pregnancy weight category, the gain category and frequency. So as you um, work with mosaic plots, I encourage you to start small. Don't try to make a mosaic plot with four variables right, right off the bat, okay? Start with one variable and then add. And this is act, this is not just for learning purposes, but when I'm create, when I'm look exploring data, this is how I do it. I look at one variable and then I start adding to it. So we can look at um, the age variable, and you see how um, we have these seven categories. Now that I've um, cleaned it up a little bit, okay, and made sure that they're all in the right order. If I want to change the direction, we use the direction parameter. So the default is to start horizontal. I want, though, the first cut to be vertical, so I'm going to change it, and then we get that vertical cut. Okay. We, you can play around with looking at other variables. Like you could look at the weight variable first, right? however, whatever you want to do there. Um, but now let's move on to two variables. So very simple, right? We can look at the gain on age. Gain is our dependent. Okay. And this looks like the graph I showed you before, but the cuts are in the wrong direction. The order of the cuts is right. Age first, then gain. Um, but the direction is wrong. So I'm going to fix the direction with um, by setting an array here indicating that the first cut is vertical and the second cut is horizontal. Right? And now it's looking a lot more like the, the graph that I showed you in the slide. Um, now some cleanup. We're gonna rotate the labels. If you're used to base R graphics, show me with the, um, how many people use or have used base R graphics with the thumbs up sign. So um, we know that when, when, when you're setting parameters in base R graphics, you start with the bottom. So the sides, like for example, you would do side equals one, side equals two, side equals three, side equals four. Here it starts with the top. I don't know what the logic of that is. That was another thing that I couldn't figure out why the, prop, why the labels weren't being rotated the way I wanted them to. But the first one here is the, is the top and then it goes clockwise. So um, if you want to rotate labels, you can do that. The defaults are not 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is all horizontal. The defaults are, are I guess, 0, 90, 0, 90. Um, I don't recommend 45, by the way. As much as possible, you want things to be horizontal. Now, a nice way to get um, a sequential um, sequential colors is with the um, our color brewer package. Using Brewer Pal, you can determine. Um, you can either just if you know the number of categories you need, you can do that, or you could set it equal to the length of the levels of weight. This is doing the same thing. I know that there's four weight categories. So I set the colors to, um, I pick four categories and use the greens palette. If you look in the help for, um, I think it's display. Display Brewer all, you can see what the different palettes are and so for this type of data, we want to use um, one of these sequential palettes. And then, oops. Okay, now, now we're getting a graph uh, that looks like the one I showed you in the slides. Not a lot of code, just um, being very specific about um, where, where we want things to be in the plot. If you want to move the labels down, there's a lot of things you can do with this, with um, labeling args. This TL means top left. So this is saying um, top is false and left is true. Uh, so we'll end up just moving the um, age ones to the bottom if that's what you want to do. 
we can change the variable names. It's a little frustrating when you're used to tidyverse and being able to use the spaces in the variable names, then you have to take them out. So um, you're going to probably want to do things like this to make your um, access labels clearer. You can um, change the, I have a couple other things here like um, moving, um, moving the variable names a little bit or justifying the labels. So these are just some minor changes to just clean up here. Looks like I introduced a little bit of a problem as well. Um, now, three variables. So again, it's just adding another variable on the list in the formula. So now we're doing splitting on weight first, then age, then the game. Um, I'm making the font size smaller, changing the spacing. This means the spacing goes by the cuts. So for every parameter, you should think about, is this the parameter that relates to the variables or is this a parameter that relates to the sides of the plot? So direction relates to the variables. The variables get split vertically or horizontally. The spacing relates to the variables, right? Is there gonna be a space between the levels of a particular variable or not? Um, label, um, rotation, right, as we saw already, has to do with the sides. So there are. this is an array of three. The point three um, means the spacing for um, weight should be point three. So we're gonna have a little bit of a border between the weight categories, but not between the age or the game categories. And that looks like this. And I'll try to make that a little bigger so um, you can see it. There is a way to not repeat the um, label categories, but um, it keeps the first ones. So that doesn't really help a lot in this particular situation. Um, I'll show you quickly where the code is for how I did it in the slides with labeling the cells, but it gets a little bit involved. That's not where I would recommend starting. So here, I, um, you know, if you're coding along, change things around, change this to um, age plus weight and see what happens, right? Or, you know, you could just, you just take these out, take out the directions, see what you get. Um, you can see what happens if you, you know, if you just do things kind of randomly, you're going to get something that's a lot harder to read um, than what you get when you follow, follow recommended practices. So if you're comfortable with tables, there's a lot you can do that you can't do with um, data in the tidy form. Um, one of those things is labeling the cells. So I'm not gonna talk through this code. I'll just point out that it's here for those of you who are interested. I'm making the same graph, just using the data in table form instead of um, kind of more tidyverse friendly data frame form. So, Here's the same graph, just data is in a different form. And now I can create labels. You can create conditional labels and um, label things using this, um, the labeling cells. I'm not sure why I picked those particular ones. Maybe I want. Okay, probably those that instead, um, but you, you get the idea. So that code is all there for you uh, to review and it should be helpful when we get to the lab later and you can um, decide whether you're gonna work on mosaic plots or alluvial diagrams or both. And we'll be here to help you with that. Um, I am out of time, so I'm gonna turn it over to Luda and to talk about alluvial diagrams. And we can take questions, I think, uh, during the lab or after the lab, I think that'll, that'll work best. So uh, this is my first example. Um, this is all based on fake data, as uh, I, I like to indicate with the kind of ridiculous unit titles, but it's based on a real world example. So as I said, I work at Amplify. Uh, we're a, a tech company. And so um, we have a lot of assessments that we like to look at. I work specifically on our science data or our science units um, looking at that data. Um, so this, uh, the, you know, my quest to understand alluvial diagrams was kind of born out of a real world question. My manager asked me to make some graphs that showed 
the movement of students um, from their uh, score level uh, in the pre-unit assessments uh, to the end of unit assessments. And he just said, go ahead and make these graphs. He didn't give me a lot of, um, you know, he didn't tell me how to do them. I uh, just kind of sent me out there. And I'll say that it took me a little while, it took me a couple of days to actually figure out how to make these graphs and make them look good. So hopefully I'm here to save you time on that. There are a lot of, there's several different packages now um, in order to do this in R and I've tried uh, several. I'll say that, um, so today I'm gonna focus on using the GG Alluvial package. I found it kind of the easiest to work with at this point, um, though I'd encourage you to try out other packages too. I have another uh, package referenced in the resources at the end, uh, but that's, that's the approach that I'm gonna focus on today. Um, so uh, as you can see, we have these graphs, we have students, um, their scores are categorized um, from one to four. Um, and so we wanted to see how many students are moving from a low level um, into a higher level. And we want to split that out, out by the units to see if there were some real disparities in these units. So I'm going to walk you through how to make this graph. I'm going to show you another example, one other example, and then I'm going to show you with the code. And then I'm going to show you just some normal, uh, some, some examples of the spectrums that I found in the wild and what kind of talk about the pros and cons of some of those. So the thing I'm going to talk about is to use alluvial diagrams. I think they can feel really cool and you want to kind of use them because they're kind of this uh, interesting different uh, data visualization style. Um, however, uh, you really want to uh, kind of make sure that your, your data makes sense for an alluvial diag. Are you showing groups moving from one state of being to another? I think that's the absolute best use case for an alluvial diagram. And a lot of other diagrams don't quite work well um, as well uh, when they're not actually showing flow. One state to another. Um, and I also think you want to have a reasonable number of groups um, and states of being. I'm not going to give a hard and fast rule of those numbers, but um, you You know, if you just got a couple uh, groups just Yeah, it's um Luna, you're breaking up a lot. It's not gonna be very interesting. But also the the I use I see the other stream often where there's just Luda. Yeah, there's a problem with the so sound. Many categories. You've just got. I have an idea, Luda. going middle ground. Actually, there are some things easily it's okay um, yeah that's better and as that a backup better? i can show if it as a backup i could show the slides and you can talk so let's tr let's try this though and then um okay yeah i have the slides all ready to go but it sound, you sound okay now so without the video on so why don't we okay try yeah so i think that this will be better okay and and please do stop me again if it's sounding bad again okay um all right, so we've got our axes. These are our different states um, where the graph that we're showing movement between. Um, here I have just a completely uh, blank graph. We'll actually, this is an example that we'll actually see later on, but here I've just stripped away most of the labeling just so that it's very easy to focus on these elements of the graph. Um, so we've got these axes here. I've just labeled them really 
plane, you know, first, second, third, fourth. So these are the different states that we're going to see movement between. We call those axes, and that's on our x-axis. Um, on our y-axis, we see these uh, stratum, and these are groups that we're going to see uh, at each uh, axis. Um, one, so one little box like this is called a stratum, um, and the whole group of them are strata. Um, and then uh, we've got um, flows. Flows are movement um, from one you know, state or axis to another. Uh, they're just from one to the other, whereas alluvium show the movement across all states or axes, all of the, you know, all of the flows together. Um, and then we've got these loads. Loads are the intersection of one alluvium and one stratum. So all together, here's all of our terminology. We've got our axes, our stratum, our flow, our alluvium, and this little thing, the load. All right. Um, and I'll keep using this terminology. Um, you know, you can refer back to this slide. Um, uh, so, oh, I do want to say also, I think uh, you all have already um, cloned the repo and you've got the slide code. So um, I'm going to be showing all code from my slides, actually. You can follow along in the armor uh, of the slides that's in the slides folder. Um, and you should be able to run all of the code that's there um, if you're on the repo. Um, uh, so you, you're welcome to run it along with me or you can just watch me as I do this. Either way works. Um, so I'm going to start making the graph that I showed you at the beginning, and I'm going to build it up level by level. So here we're starting with the simulated data um, with the pre-post, and um, here I'm just showing you the first five rows. So we've got a we've got a student ID. You know, usually there's a UUID. It's something more much more complicated, but just here for the simplicity, I'm giving you uh, just you know numbers, and um, then you can see the unit title. You can see the, um, what type of assessment the students are taking. And you can also see the, what score level they achieved um, on that assessment. Right now it's in, in this long format. Um, so in order to use the uh, GG Alluvial package, the easiest thing to do is to first make sure that your data is in the wide format by so my axes, my two states are going to be the pre-unit and the post-unit. So here, um, here I am going to go ahead and um, uh, pivot this wider, uh, pivot my data set wider um, in order to have it wide by these two elements, right? So I went from long. Um, by assessment to wide by assessment, um, and these are the score levels. All right, this allows us to use the two loads form function in the GG alluvial package. Um, and this might seem a little odd to you because now it looks like we're going back to the log format, which we are essentially, but we're adding these two variables, the alluvium um, and the stratum. And uh, this does it for you right out of the box. You give it the key, what you want to call, um, uh, you know, what you want to call it. So here I'm calling it assessment. And then you tell it uh, which axes, uh, so which of your stratum, uh, which uh, variables are your stratum. So that was, so here we have one, two, three, four. So pre and post are three, are positions three and four. So we just give those positions um, for your axes. And um, then it sets this up really nicely for you. So you're already, you're set to go. Um, in order to make the graph. So now we get to go ahead and start graphing. Um, so right, so before we do that, I just want to talk about the plot elements. Um, there's kind of two plot, two plot elements that you're going to have to choose between depending on what kind of graph you want to make. Um, either you're going to use GM flow or GM alluvium. So what is GM flow? That's going to give you the flows from one axis to the next. Um, with, uh, you know, it's just, just one axis and, and then the next one, rather than GM alluvium is going to give you the alluvia across all of the axes. Um, but I just want to point out that it's nice for GM um, set your alpha to be, uh, you know, fairly transparent so you can see uh, the flows and how they kind of intersect with each other. 
Um, for GM alluvium, it's nice to um, you're, you're, you have options and how to set your fill uh, based on maybe the starting state or the ending state. So we'll see that in another graph soon. Um, and then your last uh, plot element is that's going to give you the strata that's going to set that up. So let's go ahead and start graphing. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up my ggplot with my aesthetics as usual. My x-axis is going to equal my categorical axis variable. Um, so that's going to be assessment here, right? So this is, um, uh, you know, pre or post in this case. And then this is so easy because we've used the two loads form. We can just set stratum equal to stratum and alluvium equal to alluvium. Um, super straightforward. And then here I'm just going to add geom stratum. Um, so then uh, with this, uh, you can see that we've just got our uh, stratum our stratum here, we don't have the flows between, um, and we, we don't have any colors. So next I'm gonna add the flows. Um, these are, uh, this is just added here. Like I said, I add alpha 0.5, so it's fairly transparent. Um, so just adding this little chunk here. <laughs> so now we see the flows, but this isn't giving us a lot of information yet, right? Um, because it's a little hard for us to see what the actual flows are. We need to add a fill. So here I'm setting my fill equal to my strata and that's within the aesthetics. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get back to that. Um, and uh, that gives us the, uh, the actual colors. So here I wanna point out, I'm just using the total default ggplot um, and the default colors, right? So we're gonna beautify this. Uh, this isn't how it should be in the end, but um, just to point out right now, that's, uh, that's uh, where we're at. Um, so here we've added fill. Um, the next thing I wanna point out is, uh, so uh, just as Joyce talked about, I actually want to switch my factor uh, order. Um, I want four to be at the top because that's the top score, that's the, that's the best. And I want to be able to track my students going from, um, you know, uh, I really want to see them going up to four. Uh, and that's what I'm most interested in. And so I'm going to hit it with that factor reverse from the four cats package. Um, and now I've got four at the top, at the bottom. Uh, so that's nice. Um, and, and that's something, you know, you want to pay attention to is what, what, what is the category that you're most interested in tracking with your eye. Um, so then the next thing I'm going to do, and this is, you know, specific to this graph, but I wanted to point out is easy to do. Um, here I'm going to get six graphs for the price of one by using facet wrap by my unit title. So this was across all of my assessments, but I really want it to be by unit title. Um, so now out by each of these ridiculous sounding units. Um, and uh, I can see the flow from each of these units. And this was actually really relevant to us and or to me and my work uh, because it allowed us to see that uh, for some units, we've got a lot of students, um, you know, going from one all the way up to four. Whereas in some units, uh, we have a very few students going up from level one to and uh, this let us kind of start inspecting those units a little bit more, looking at the assessments and maybe what the students were learning. It also um, was a way to kind of verify some of our suspicions about some of these units. So it was very useful. Um, so next, um, I'm going to manually add some colors uh, because, uh, and uh, as Joyce mentioned, you can use our color brewer, you can use, um, you know, various palettes. Uh, there are a lot of different ways. I actually used our color to pick my colors, but I'm just showing you how to add them manually. Um, or that's what I did. That's what I ended up doing in this case. So um, here I've added colors. So at this point, I want to talk about use of color in your alluvial diagrams. Um, your strata 
are going to be one of two types, right? So they might be like this, where there's the underlying ordinal um, element, the, the, vari the variables, variables ordinal, there's an underlying variable. And in this case, uh, level one is actually, we consider that like a lack of, uh, like a showing of lack of knowledge of the science. Um, whereas two, three, and four are increasing intensity of uh, understanding of the science concepts. So I chose to make level one gray while I made two, three, and four, um, you know, increasingly dark. So you'll want to use this kind of sequential palette in this case. However, in the next example, you'll see the, the categorical variable is discrete. Um, you'd want to use a qualitative palette where you have separate colors rather than um, showing sequential elements. So here I'm just beautifying the graph. I find that these defaults are quite small and hard to see. Um, and uh, I just like to kind of uh, fix things up a little bit. So I'm, I'm not gonna go through everything here, but you know, I, use, I leverage the theme in order to uh, take away those grid lines, some of the, um, and change the text size, put the lead bottom because I think that gives us more space. Um, I also like to, I like to um, put the, uh, 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 set the labels to commas so that the axis has commas in it, um, just makes the numbers easier to read, like you can see here with the thousand. So here's my final graph, um, as you can see, as we saw before, um, just, you know, with that uh, one piece of one big chunk of code there. Um, so uh, there we are. Um, all right. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to another example now. Um, but I just wanted to give you a second to, you know, look, look at this a little bit more. So next we're going to move on. Uh, so, so here, you know, I was using the geom flow because we're just moving between two states um, and we're, uh, you know, just showing that those, those flows. But now I want to show you a, a geom alluvium example where we're actually following an alluvium all the way across the graph. So this is made. Um, it was made by David Neuserling. I really love this example, though. This was an example of his um, for going through the process of uh, finding a, a data science job. Um, so I think what, you know, this is really interesting for us to see all of us that have gone through that kind of brutal process. Um, and I think it's also really wonderfully done uh, for several reasons. Um, so I'm going to talk this as well, um, uh, kind of more quickly though. Um, so here we see the raw data again. Here you can see his data is already wide by these states, right? So we have contact, first stage, second stage outcome. Let me just talk through this really quickly. So this is the first contact. Was it um, internally um, at his workplace? Um, through one of those job sites online, um, through LinkedIn, <clears throat> uh, through his own personal network, or through a recruiter. And then um, what did that lead to in the second stage? Like maybe a coffee meeting, maybe it was ghosted, right? And they, people stopped communicating with him uh, or a phone call, or he was rejected. Um, and then there was a second stage. He was either ghosted or there was an interview. Um, maybe that role disappeared. We've all had that happen, right? Um, and then there's, a, you know, he also withdrew um, from some of these roles. And then we've got a final outcome here where he was either ghosted, rejected, withdrew, or we've got this final offer. And you can see this alluvium starting all the way at the job site. On some job site, he went to um, and came down to the phone call um, and then came over to the interview and that gave him an offer. So we can follow that whole um, you know, experience all the way through. Uh, the, sorry, the alluvium um, through all those uh, different axes. Um, so here also I want to point out the color choice is nice because um, here these are discrete, um, 
uh, categories. Uh, so we've got a qualitative color uh, panel, a color choice. I do think that this might not be colorblind friendly, but I didn't want to change uh, his graph because that is how. And I, you know, I don't want to, I want to present what he, he did himself. Um, but it is good to pay attention to, you know, colorblind friendly, especially when you've got these kinds of all kinds of noodly uh, spaghettis going everywhere. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, so looking at the raw data, we've already got it wide. So that makes it really easy for us to go ahead and um, uh, uh, you know, oh, sorry, right before that, I want to point out that he, so we've got um, NAs in some of these state stages. So he's made this final outcome that lets him color the alluvium by the final outcome. And so we're just using this coalesce function um, and it takes the you know, first um, non-NA section and this is going backwards from outcome to second stage to first stage. Um, so we've got a final outcome column as well. And now we can use this nice two loads form. The key is the, he called it contact and the axes were two to five here, right? So that's um, two, three, four, five, right there. Um, and then we've, or equal to that contact, that's our key, stratum to stratum, alluvium to alluvium and label. So here he's adding a label um, to, the, to the graphs, uh, to each stratum. Um, so you do that with the label equal to stratum. Now we're adding the geom alluvium um, and he's setting the fill to his final outcome because he wants what happened in the end rather than with my graphs, I wanted to show where students uh, were starting out and where, you know, and then uh, that would allow us to see really easily. Okay, so they started at level one and now they're ending up at level two or three or four, right? Um, this color equal to dark gray, Let's us um, uh, see these nice uh, little uh, these lines. This adds a little um, border to each of the alluvium, um, so it lets us see them a little bit more easily. And then the Na.rm is necessary both in the geom alluvium, the geom stratum, because he has some Na's um, in some of those, uh, you know, uh, in some of those rows. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. Um, so then we are adding the GM text with the sat equal to stratum um, and, you know, doing some beautification here as well. Um, also using the minimal, um, uh, changing the text size, low legend position, um, you know, adding a caption and also manually adding the color choice. So here we have that final outcome again. Um, and I wanted to just contrast this with if we had chosen to use GM flow. So if his decision had been, I want to visualize what happened between each of these different axes, um, that might have been his goal, right? And so in that case, we would have used GM flow and that would have, um, that would have let us see like, okay, all internal uh, uh, contacts led to a coffee uh, meeting in the first stage. Uh, you know, whereas job site led to either ghosted or a phone call or rejected. Um, and, and then we're kind of cut off. We can't follow all the way across, but we, then we see all the, oh, the coffee was kind of split up into ghosted interview, no role and withdrew. Um, you know, and phone call got kind of like the phone, most of the phone calls, the like largest bulk went to interview, but then a good bulk also went to ghosted or withdrew. Um, not many, you know, so we can, we can see that, that flow from each of the axes, but we don't necessarily, we don't see the, the flow across um, the entire graph. So just, you know, a contrast there. So now I want to get into the examples. Um, I'd like to make this a little bit uh, more interactive if I have the time. Um, but um, if you give me just a second. So, uh, so this is our first example. I think this is a great example. Um, I, I really uh, like it. This is the very recent New York City ranked choice. Uh, 
for the Democratic uh, mayoral elections. And uh, I think, so this is from New York Times, I think this is a great example of an alluvial diagram in the wild um, because, uh, you know, so these are the last three rounds. Um, and it really, it's really nice. It really lets us see, okay, so in this case, um, Yang was a little at state at round seven. And so his votes, um, uh, some of them went to Eric Adams, a very similar um, amount went to Catherine Garcia, and then a very small amount went to uh, Wiley. And a good amount also went, uh, were eliminated since they were uh, votes for people that were no longer in the running, right? And um, one thing that I want to point out is that um, a really nice, so a really nice thing that they did here that I haven't talked about is that um, rather than just sticking with a um, color from the beginning or a color from the end, we actually see this color changing from the beginning to the end to, to demonstrate uh, if a candidate's votes from went from a candidate to another, whereas if they stayed with the same candidate. And I think that that was really nicely done, really well done. I don't really have any criticisms of this uh, alluvial, but I think what's uh, it's useful for us to look at some alluvials that, um, you know, maybe aren't so strong. Uh, so this next one, um, uh, so this uh, alluvial diagram is from The Economist and it's of uh, uh, refugees, um, then their origin and then the, their destination countries and uh, whether or not they were accepted or rejected their uh, decisions. Um, and I think this is really nicely done. Uh, I, although this is a little bit different than what I've recommended for color choice, because these are, you know, discrete categories in both cases and origin and destination. Um, but they've kind of shown them in these sequ sequential color palettes. But I see that they were trying to group origin and destination together. So I, I see what they're doing there. Um, although I think, so, so this is a little bit confusing. So we get to this accepted state and then we flow back to where the um, decisions were by origin. So it's a little confusing because you're kind of um, going backward in the information. I think they could have actually eliminated this section and colored each um, alluvium by um, accepted or rejected. That might have been a little bit um, uh, more compact or easier. But I think generally this is a, a fairly good visualization. Um, all right. Um, so this next one, um, I kind of, I want to ask what people see with this one that makes it a little different from all of the other uh, alluvials that I have shown. Yeah, so this, exactly, Nick, there's no transition here from one state to another. Our x-axis is just a demo, different demographic categories, really. And I think I've seen um, some alluvials that do this, and I think, you know, you, you can gain some information from them to some extent. However, it's kind of an odd use case for uh, an alluvial. I think where alluvials really shine is showing that movement from one state to another. Um, so, so here we've got class um, and then the sex and then the age. And, uh, you know, these are just flows. So really we just see um, from first class how many were uh, um, that survived were male or female. But it's kind of, it's, you can't really follow that across to child or adult. I think this would probably work better actually as a mosaic where you'd see performance in relationship with one another. Um, so I would suggest that. And I use this one specifically because it's actually from the GG Alluvial um, CRAN repository. So um, you'll probably see this if you go, you know, look at the um, vignette. And uh, I find it super confusing. And it actually took me a while to understand how to make alluvial diagrams because I think a lot of the examples kind of fall into this category rather than really showing a flow from one state to other, another. Obviously, this is no critique of the this package, but um, I think these examples can be a little bit confusing and don't, um, they're not the examples that kind of most clearly show the utility of an alluvial diagram. So 
that's that's my point there. Um, all right. Um, so uh, this next one is about um, the. Uh, so this is uh, giving us uh, cancer uh, information. So different cancers. Uh, split out by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender. But I want to point out here that once again, these are flows. Um, and so really all we gain um, from uh, gender here or sex um, is uh, that we find out that um, each of the ethnicities are kind of evenly split male, female, which is surprising given our you know normal population, especially since we've included a bunch of different camps here. Um, I also want to point out that we've got a lot going on here. This, um, there are a lot of um, stratum and it starts getting really hard to see what's actually happening. Um, so I think this is also an example of, you know, um, kind of overwhelming the viewer. Uh, but really my biggest criticism here is that I don't think that this chunk really adds information to our graph at the, in this uh, situation. Um, uh, here's the last example, and there's just way too much going on here. So we've got um, uh, different uh, gas sales uh, by state, so petroleum, natural gas, coal, and retail electrical sales, and you just can't see anything, right? Like, this is just complete spaghetti. Um, so, you know, I would highly suggest avoiding this kind of approach. Um, so in summary, I want you to, uh, you know, ensure that your data really fits the alluvial specifications. Does it make sense? Um, it can be fun to make alluvial diagrams, but I would say often your data might not be the best fit for an alluvial diagram, unfortunately. Um, so when you go to, uh, when you do have data that's a great fit, that's exciting, then you can reshape the data to wide by your axes um, if needed. Um, and in order to use that two loads form function, if it's already wide, you can just go ahead and use it. Consider whether you want to highlight flows or alluvium, right? Are you just showing the movement from one state to another, or are you showing the movement across the whole graph? Um, because that can give different uh, information, and I'm not saying one is right or the other. It just really depends on what you're trying to communicate. Also, uh, pay attention to your use of color. So I would say both in terms of your variable type. Um, and then, so, you know, whether it uh, has an underlying order or if it's discrete. Um, and then also whether you're coloring from the starting state or the ending state, or even like I, we saw in the New York Times example where you might be blending once, uh, you know, moving from one color to the other from each state. Um, so you have all of these uh, great options for color use. Um, and lastly, have fun. These are really fun graphs. They're really cool to make. Um, I think, uh, you know, they're pretty exciting. So have a great time if you make them. Um, so here I've got some of your, you know, basic resources for um, how to make these. Um, this last one is a, the GM parallel sets or with, from the GG Force um, package. So they're, they're definitely uh, different options for how to make this.